Greetings, everyone, and welcome to the Embrace Research Integrity, Avoid Scientific Misconduct, and Enhance Scholarly Research Roundtable with our presenters Jay Bhatt, Nalini Mahajan, and Meenal Oak. Uh, before we get started, I wanted to um, provide a couple of housekeeping notes. This is a much more informal um, discussion. So um, we ask people to stay muted um, out of respect just to keep noise down, but we do invite you to participate and unmute yourself and speak throughout the discussion over the next hour. I would like to also introduce our moderator, Dr. Ramesh Gaur. Dr. Gaur is presently Dean and Director at Indira Gandhi National Center for the Arts in New Delhi. His past assignments include University Librarian at Jaharwal Nehru University in New Delhi. Um, he is also a Fulbright Scholar and has visited 24 countries. Dr. Gar is the first Indian nominated as member International Advisory Committee UNESCO, Memory of the World Program and member UNESCO Global Task Force on Indigenous Languages. He is also a member of the Research Council for CSIR, NISCAIR, and serves on a variety of boards as well as um, other committees. So without further ado, I am introducing Dr. Gar to kick off our discussion. Thank you, Jordan, for your very kind and generous introduction. So good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Good evening. Uh, I join Jordan in extending a very warm welcome to you all to this uh, roundtable discussion, Embrace Research Integrity, Avoid Scientific Misconduct and Enhance Scholarly Research. It is true uh, that uh, research integrity, or some may call it academic integrity, is uh, key to enhance the quality of research. And it helped in many ways in, in terms of uh, giving your, uh, improving your academic reputation, your credibility as a researcher. So the, the first message to start with the round table or discussion is this following academic, embrace academic integrity for your own interest, because it is going to help you it is going to help you more than your institute, more than anybody else. So uh, to discuss this topic, uh, uh, to interact with the uh, various aspects of uh, research integrity, we have very eminent panel. So before starting the program, let me uh, introduce the panel uh, with us. Uh, uh, let me first introduce Professor Nalini Mahajan who is an academic librarian and instructor, day master, and a former director of Marinjoy Medical Library, which she managed for 30 years, 32 years. Nalini has been a leader in developing and applying emerging technologies for providing timely access to high quality, critically important information to help clinicians and consumers to make informed healthcare decisions and improve patient's outcome. She is widely regarded as go-to librarian in physical medicine and rehabilitation. She is an international speaker, has presented papers, published articles, taught various kind of uh, uh, courses, and held many leadership positions at uh, MLA and SLA. Among her various recognition, Nalini has been recipient of Winifred as well, Prize, DBIO Distinguished Member Award, Illinois uh, Librarian of the Year Award, COD Outstanding Faculty Award, and MLA Scroll of Exemplary Services. So with me, please welcome uh, Nalini and thanks her for agreeing to be one of the panelists in today's uh, discussion. Let me uh, welcome and introduce uh, our uh, another uh, eminent panelist, Mr. Jay Bhatt who is currently the engineering librarian in the scholarly connections department at uh, Drexel University. In this position, he provides individual and small group consultation, 
research support to faculty and students and conducts instructional sessions as requested by faculty members in engineering and biomedical engineering department. He's passionate about raising awareness about academic and research integrity, open access, open data, and open educational resources in engineering among the faculty and students. Jai is an active member of several special library association communities, uh, including Asian chapter, engineering, Philadelphia, and science and technology. He is a member of the Engineering Libraries Division of the American Society for Engineering Education. Among several awards he received are the Engineering Librarian of the Year Award from the Engineering Division of the Special Libraries Association and the former I Vernot Distinguished Service Award from the Engineering Libraries Division of ASE. So please uh, join hands with me to welcome uh, Jay. Uh, for today's uh, roundtable discussion. Uh, last but not uh, least, uh, Dr. Mrs. Meenal Oak. Uh, a, my, uh, I know her very well uh, during last uh, many years as a young uh, colleague. She is emerging as a good professional. Uh, she is currently librarian uh, uh, and coordinator of IGNO DL Center at Maharashtra Education Society in Pune, India since 1996. A doctorate of LIS and rank holder of SP Pune University and MES Koha project coordinator. She teaches library science courses as well as instrumental in launching of the autonomous programs of LIS, SETNET training and PG delivery in 2015. She is a Bowman chairperson of RC CAST committee, Maharashtra, India, has written five books and 29 papers completed two research projects under the University Grants SPU from Pune. He is investi principal investigator for many projects and having received Best Teacher Award, uh, he has received uh, two times uh, by the MES Rotary Club, Pune Ajankya Deepai Patil College University, and also the Best Paper Award from Malimnet India Conference. So welcome, Meenal, and uh, look forward to interaction with uh, all of you. Thank so you. today's roundtable, uh, we are going to have uh, interaction first with the, all panelists. And then uh, after that, uh, we'll, we'll open up for all of you, all the participants. So be ready with your questions uh, after uh, interaction with the panel uh, uh, members. I will come to you for to take up your questions. Uh, so as, as you know that... Uh, when we talk about uh, research integrity, it's a very wide and very, very uh, broad topic. Uh, there are a number of issues in that. Uh, in, in such a one hour discussion, we may not be able to cover all the aspects of research integrity. So we will focus on certain areas where I believe uh, librarians have a domain expertise and librarians are the best people to uh, deal with those issues and are the people who can help researcher in uh, enhancing the quality of their research in many ways. So in this uh, uh, roundtable discussion, we'll have a, uh, several rounds of discussion. And in the first round, I will like to start with the panel. And uh, uh, first, uh, I will start with Meenal. Yes, sir. So Meenal, my questions to you is that, uh, in your opinion, why researchers engage in uh, unethical practices uh, in research? Uh, are okay. What kind okay. of uh, reasons uh, would you like to say something on that? Yeah, uh, sure. First of all, thank you so much for opening uh, this round uh, from me. And uh, actually, as far as this uh, uh, unethical practices are concerned, in our earlier session, we have already seen what is not an ethical practice of research. And simultaneously, what are the best practices of research? That also we have seen in detail. 
so uh, basically research ethics it focuses on the moral principles and we are expecting from the researchers to follow those procedures whenever they are conducting their own research as such but even though we observe that many times research scholars are uh, following varied unethical practices and in my opinion uh, the major reasons uh, are uh, the uh, immense uh, pressure to publish more papers in a limited uh, period of time for getting the research grants to improve the H index. So these are the uh, major reasons behind that. And uh, uh, of course, in this regard, uh, I came across to an interesting paper, a study which was conducted by a team of scientists from uh, VU University, Amsterdam. And uh, where they tried to study the personality traits uh, which are associated with the uh, research misbehavior among the scientists. And uh, interestingly, what they found that uh, the scientists are more susceptible uh, to committing research misbehavior. And uh, specifically, if they are showing the traits uh, such as tendency to be unemotional, even detached from the conventional mm -hmm. morality yeah. and uh, inclined to deceive and manipulate others. So they are uh, doing such practices. That's what their conclusion is. So uh, the paper was very uh, interesting and the team of scientists work very hard to find out the traits and uh, in a way it's a direction for the information professionals how can we imbibe good reading habits among them what are the uh, ways uh, that uh, will make them capable enough to take the right decision whenever they are in the process of research so uh, that's what is very very important and the uh, term which they use for all these traits the cumulative <laughs> term is uh, Machiavellianism. This is the term they use to indicate all these trends uh, among the uh, research scholars. So in a way, we should focus on the research scholars behavior and uh, capable, make them capable enough so that they can interpret on their own. Uh, they can assess on their own. Even uh, they should make their own decision. Uh, in a way, we should uh, built up their thinking level and rightly at the end their wisdom capacity uh, that's what is uh, my opinion thank you minal uh, you for giving this uh, perspective but uh, if we talk about uh, many other reasons and one of the most important reasons i came across is that hmm. many people who commit such errors uh, hmm. they, they are not aware of it they are totally hmm. ignorant about that because they don't understand what are the real uh, unethical practices. And it is very intentional pragarism. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's very important for us to define and make them aware of that. So, Jay, right. could, you, could you tell us that uh, what are, uh, when we talk about unethical practices and research misconduct or science mis misconduct is one of the major issues. So, if you, uh, can you, can you, uh, can you tell us how to educate a researcher about uh, this research misconduct or scientific misconduct? Yes, this is an excellent question. <laughs> and your first question has brought to this background point so that we can now continue a dialogue and teach in education aspects. So this is absolutely critical that our students, our faculty, our researchers uh, learn about scientific misconduct so that they can avoid it. But how to do it? is uh, definitely something that we do need to think about. Uh, as you said, uh, many of them are unaware of uh, this. And this, if you look at the present trend on the, just simply searching on the internet or even social media platform, you will see that people are just uh, copying and pasting some mm, quotes from a poetry or even an image without giving any credit to the source where it is coming from. And this could be even uh, educators sometimes. And uh, the question is how to bring to their awareness that what you found something which you have not created, uh, which is not your own creation, need to be recognized, need to be credited. So how can we provide that education? And I think it should start right from even uh, from high school. And we have seen even in school projects where I work in a public library, 
uh, a, uh, a seventh grade student comes with his mother or her, uh, with her parents at my library desk and tells that my teacher required me to uh, create a bibliography for this paper. So that, uh, uh, so we had to tell them from their perspective at that age level, what is a good citation? So that training happens right here, even in schools and that has to continue so that when they come to college, they're already aware of it. But at the same time, what they need to learn about research fabrication, uh, what kind of uh, data fabrication happens, why that happens also on. Now academics at the research level, the pressures are um, uh, different. Uh, everybody wants their tenure. Everybody wants their research to be known faster than anybody else. And that kind of competitions also creates pressure on students to cite something or uh, use uh, manipulate data and uh, some kind of automatic citation will touch base at some point, which is quite sort of integrated because I'm going to tie that in because uh, education also requires how to use those good citation management softwares for automatic citations. That comes later, but before that, we have the Office of Research Ethics and Publications, the entire series of courses for graduate and PhD students. So we talk about uh, examples of scientific mi mi misconduct. Uh, in our previous session, uh, I strongly encourage everyone to look at the video, which is now on the SLS Learning Hub website, uh, and you'll get some idea. But a couple of examples I'm going to repeat so that uh, uh, catch to catch up with this, help us in teaching scenarios. Uh, many databases like Science Direct and IEEE, and even the discovery platforms like um, Summon, for example, or Dragon Search that we have, um, when you just type retracted papers uh, or predatory publications, and there will be a question about it later on, uh, you are going to discover those papers that have been retracted. Now, what is retraction? Retraction means that uh, uh, the paper was published, but at later on, it was discovered that either the data was fabricated or uh, it was plagiarized or uh, long images was uh, used and the credit was not given. And the whole process of um, uh, retracting, meaning that the articles remains on the publication, but on each page, a retracted uh, notice happens, meaning that these authors of the paper uh, are being punished because they did some, uh, crime uh, in publications. Now we collect examples of this and uh, teach uh, in the classes. We have workshops. We create scenarios in which students have to identify why these papers were retracted. So we need to understand different examples of workshops, seminars, uh, class discussions, different student associations for graduate students, PhD students will have their own event uh, to educate them. And we have seen that because um, uh, every time we have international students coming in in the fall term, their uh, coordinators require us to do a session on research ethics right in the beginning of their term. So teaching, education, workshops, library guides, exploration, retraction, um, watch databases, they are now existing. Uh, and you can search for different keywords and you're gonna pull up those articles, why were they retracted? What were the reasons? There was a, a very famous article a couple of months ago that came out. Uh, it was very strange because this was the article about COVID-19 research in which they claimed that masks don't help. They fabricated data and uh, they published it. Just imagine this kind of wrong fabricated data coming in the uh, uh, among hundreds of people all over the world. What, what are they going to do? think. Uh, so there are serious implications and we need to educate and there are numbers which we can do that. Um, Excellent, Jay. Uh, you have uh, given a very uh, detailed and very uh, wonderful uh, explanation. Uh, Nalini, uh, when Jay uh, was talking about various measures to be taken and one of the important measures is uh, through workshop, uh, educa user education and other programs. So when we talk about research misconduct, uh, which generally covers falsification, fabrication, and plagiarism. So when we need to educate our uh, researcher, we, we need to make them, what is the difference between intentional and 
unintentional plagiarism. So could you just uh, explain or define this uh, to the better, better benefit of the participant and the wider community? What is the difference between uh, intentional and uh, uh, unintentional uh, plagiarism? Nalini, please uh, unmute. Uh, you are on mute. Right. Sorry about that. Um, so I am going to talk about um, from two perspectives. One is from the medical perspective because I was in a medical setting for a long time. And then I'm also an academic librarian at the college. Um, and at the college level, what we saw is mostly students who are just coming out of high school, they actually do a lot of unintentional plagiarism. And the reason is they really do not know what plagiarism means. So they will actually copy and paste and, you know, um, um, things, and I just wanted to make sure that I talk about a little bit. Um, this is um, uh, 10 types of plagiarism, and it's based on the findings from a worldwide survey that was done of nearly 900 secondary and higher education instructors. And some of it Jay already mentioned, but for example, the first one is clone. That is submitting another work word for word and one's own. So what they do is when they are given um, an assignment, uh, they have the fear of getting good grades. They also procrastinate everything because we get students at the last date before they are supposed to submit uh, one of the um, exercises. And they don't realize that taking, whether copying and pasting or taking just a few keywords out and replacing them, paraphrasing them, they don't understand that it's actually all plagiarism. Uh, we had one student recently who showed me actually a website that he was designing for one of the um, exercises. When I looked at the website, it looked, I could make out that it was not really written, nothing was written by him. Um, it was about Italian paintings. And um, I asked him, I said, did you, is this your original uh, writing? And he said, yes, it is my original writing. So I said, it looks like, I'm not sure, but I have read it somewhere. And we did a test in front of him. I did, of course, ask him, um, you know, do you mind if we look at it just to show you what are the consequences of all this? So it was a very good session. We sat down, we went through that. He did not know that he could take pieces out of multiple websites and put them and made it like his own. So that is unintentional plagiarism. When they do the intentional, which is basically going to the websites, paying money to get the papers, um, copying somebody else's original work, but not giving any reference or citations, uh, calling your, uh, somebody else's work your original work, those are, of course, the intentional plagiarism. And we also at the, um, our hospital, what we saw was, first of all, what we used to do, which is, I think would be very helpful to everyone. Whenever a uh, resident, uh, we had a very big program of uh, public, you know, for publishing and research and publishing. So whenever a resident wanted to start a particular project, they had to come to the library. It was mandatory for them. And we would run a search for them, a very comprehensive search, which was the review of the literature. They didn't, even though they were already, they were done with their MDs, they were residents, they still did not know how to do research. They did not know how to cite references. We had to go through each step very carefully. And we had to tell them how to really write the papers. It was very interesting to see that someone who has gone through 
the college for eight years and is starting the residency program, but does not know these things. So they would actually, we would get um, residents who would copy every single thing from a paper and write an abstract and give it to us. And then we would look at it and we knew right away because I would have to check that where it was coming from. So we then showed them that it was very important to do a literature review so they don't know where the gaps are and they could not afford to um, copy somebody else's material intentionally because the cons consequences would be really, uh, really bad. They could be um, taken away, you know, they could not probably publish something in that journal again. And then also the hospital would not allow them to do any further research. So once they understood the difference between the intentional and unintentional um, plagiarism, I think things became much better for them and it was much clearer. Uh, yes, Dr. sir, Nalini, I fully, fully, fully agree with you that what you have uh, tried to uh, give us an uh, explanation is very well justified. And Jay, I'm coming to you only. Like when, mm -hmm. we, when, you, when we were talking about uh, this uninten unintentional or international plagiarism, I fully support you that many students are not aware how mm -hmm. exactly uh, to cite and what are the ways of using others' material. So Jay, uh, why don't you tell us what are the various ways of using, legitimate use, uh, ways of using others' ideas or text in the writings? Mm. Okay, that's a wonderful question again. Uh, and I would just add to one of the comments in reference to Nalini's discussion about plagiarism. And that was plagiarism can be of any type, not just a research paper. We yes. have our computer science students in our group where uh, they developed a mechanism or even copying a computer software code yes. in writing programs. Mm. And it was very hard uh, uh, to see the difference uh, because how can the code be the same by the same uh, the students yeah, yeah, are different. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yes. So, well, right. so, the other. Yeah. So, so the professor yeah. says so, so discovered. Yeah. Right. So, so, so that is why uh, uh, this is very much relevant to what uh, this question is about what are the different ways uh, which we can cite. So there's a, a, a score, there's a system of uh, uh, various uh, systems like IEEE or APA mm -hmm. or MLA have a ways in which you can go to cite a software. But remember, in today's world, research is not just journal articles. There are a number of different types of sources that uh, have to be used. One example is the huge generation of data sets that are happening, whether it is in social sciences, whether it is in sciences or engineering. And a lot of data repositories are also created institutional repositories are created, open access um, material mm -hmm. is created, right. open access books are created, and how to cite those. And the biggest challenge comes when uh, a student uh, is thinking of using a, not just students, I'm talking about researchers, I'll give you that example also in terms of types of materials and how to be citing that, is, um, Images uh, need to be um, make sure that they are in a copyright free problem, uh, uh, platform. So whether I can use this image in my research or not, we have seen a, uh, enormous amount of use of images uh, uh, in the social media without even checking uh, whether this image is in the copyright platform or not, or what are the licensing mechanisms. They need to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, I have an example of a professor who was publishing a book um, uh, sometime years, years back, but he wanted to include images from 25 research papers uh, uh, that he wanted to use in this book. This is a very high uh, 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 technology book related to uh, uh, sleep rhythms. It's about how the sleep patterns uh, happens uh, at night and how people sleep and what impact sleep kind of things. And there were a lot of images. Now these images were on um, uh, commercial publishers like Science Direct 
uh, or Wiley and Springer. Now, each publisher has its own ways of specifying how they can use image. You just simply cannot grab that image, put it mm. in your paper. Right. There mm. will be a lot of lawsuits can happen. Mm. You must consult with a publisher um, because another problem is once the paper is published in a commercial publishers like elsewhere, then Springer and all those, those days, the copyright was transferred from the author to the publisher. So mm. uh, even if you ask that author, the author will right. send it to the publisher. Mm. Now, in this particular case, what happened was uh, there were 25 images and each image was different cost. Someone, something was, the publisher was asking for $500, so $600 or $1,000, even the image to be included in the paper. And that professor said, this, I cannot afford it. I cannot take a chance to spend that, that much money. And so he went away with doing something else. Uh, but uh, that is one thing we need to educate our students that you need to be very careful about copyright issues, how to cite them. Uh, so we have images to think about, you have software to think about, you have journal articles, you have conference papers, you have patents, inventions. Um, if it is a medical device um, project for biomedical engineers, mm -hmm. you have to cite uh, FDA's regulations, standards uh, of safety. So all of these different types of material have different ways of citations. Another, Thanks, one last yeah. comment I want to add yeah. Yeah. is just something happened only a couple of weeks ago on June 4th, there is an article came out in which Switzerland is now thinking about uh, 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 self citations as a scientific misconduct. Just right. imagine mm -hmm. what will happen if this materializes. The mm. researchers are citing their own papers because they want to increase the citation data. And uh, when we talk about another question, we'll come back to that later on when that question comes up. So uh, the number of uh, citation formats are different citation style are different ways we can cite, but the citation management software like EndNote and Mendeley can help you in the process. Uh, but the automatic citation can help but at the same time, yeah. it can also impact plagiarism because exactly. people are just citing without even reading the paper. Yes. But yeah. not only that, if Thank I you. may say, um, yeah, I think you touched upon it, but um, each journal actually requires their own format. So even if I am told APA or MLA or Turban, or, uh, you still have to go with the format that particular journal requires. And in medical and scientific fields, it's very, very common. So you have to train those students in those formats and you have to tell them that you cannot just use um, MLA or APA seventh edition or eighth edition without checking with the publishers and the editorial department. Yeah, thank uh, Nalini and Jay for uh, value additions. So uh, you have given very good examples, but one basic thing which I would also like to add in this, uh, we have to remind them, we have to tell them that there are only three ways of using others' idea. That is by summarizing, paraphrasing, or quotation. There is no other way you can use others' material. So by all the citations and everything is linked with this together, all citation is style, and you are very right that we have to uh, either guidelines are providing certain kind of which citation style to be used, or you can choose according to your subject discipline. Yes. So, Nalini, I'm coming to you now. Uh, like many people uh, always confuse and they don't know, like, uh, what are the quality plagiarism checking software? Because is it, it is important uh, uh, to find out that what you have written, is there any intentional or unintentional uh, similarities or plagiarism. So what, what is your views on good quality plagiarism checking software? I went through a few articles and I was looking actually um, at some of the free software applications that the students and the instructors both can use. Uh, Turn me in, uh, Turnitin is of course, you know, used uh, by the universities a lot. 
But what I found out that there are a few software applications, which is UniCheck is one of them. Grammarly is another one. Um, and that Grammarly um, checker actually de detects plagiarism in your text and checks for other writing issues as well. And then Plagiarisma, it works on Windows, Android, Blackberry, Moodle, et cetera. Then there is Wiper. These are all free actually. Uh, Qtext. Um, and what I can do is later on, I can actually send um, the links for these websites where they can go and look at them in details because there are two articles that I have the citations for where they actually go and describe in details the pros and cons of these um, uh, plagiarism software applications. So there are several free that are available and um, they do a very good job because they go into depth it's not just at the paragraph level or the title level, they go into the full text of the article. And when you actually try to uh, put that text, it will even go to the depths of telling you where one portion comes up from, where the second portion comes up, then you have filters that you can use to say that I, don't want anything which is just in some common area. Because um, when we talk about plagiarism, intentional, unintentional, but also there is such a thing as commonly known facts. And there you don't have to cite and it's not intentional or unintentional plagiarism because that's a common fact. So if we are talking about um, Washington as the capital, it's, it's a common fact. We are not really talking about taking that information, even if it's published in other things. So these um, software applications actually go into very details, allow you to uh, filter and get the information to, um, to the detailed level, which is, Thank you, Nalini. I will be I will... glad to do that. So uh, now uh, I, uh... In this round, last question to uh, Minal. Minal, uh, what are the important exclusions for checking similarities? Because it is important that you should know what is to be excluded while checking similarity. Yeah, uh, it's a really very important question because uh, whenever you are checking the similarity, uh, the uh, checker must be uh, really aware what can be excluded. Uh, from the uh, actual thesis or uh, from the project because many times uh, the similarities where we found uh, in the area of literature review or uh, in the institutional profiles, these are the common chapters where we are uh, getting so much uh, similarities uh, from the entire websites, the data has been copied unintentionally by the students many times. And then we have to uh, verify that and we have to get it corrected. Even we have to guide many times to them that uh, go and correct it and we have to suggest various ways, try to think, try to write in your own words because why it's showing the uh, similarity, it is because you have copied the entire text from the website. So many times we have to show the real source from where they copied the text because it's getting highlighted very well in the um, plagiarism checking software. So many times, it even it is common in case of the PhD research scholars, the highest percentage uh, of similarity which I found, it was 70% in case of PhD uh, thesis. So that was the highest uh, percentage which I found and really it was shocking for me also. And uh, unintentional uh, and it, many times uh, repetition, repetitively, we have to check the uh, percentage of similarity. For one thesis, we have to check for two to three times also uh, for get, getting the percentage down because after uh, you know, requesting them to uh, get it corrected in their own words. 
so that channelizes them to think properly and to write in their own words expressively so the major areas i think we should uh, ex generally exclude are uh, as uh, information put in quotations of course then the references contents preface and acknowledgments which we have to exclude certainly then uh, few generic terms which are commonly used if it's showing plagiarism then of course the percentage will increase so we should exclude the generic uh, terms then uh, the standard symbols even the small matches of uh, common knowledge and the uh, certain coincidental terms also we can exclude and uh, in many softwares uh, we have to set the default value this feature is also available turnitin software gives you that feature you can yeah. set the default value so uh, it depends on the university to university uh, i think thank this you, is the, these are the areas thank you minal so we are, we almost have 40 minutes of round or discussion with the panelists so now i would like to i would like to give chance to uh, uh, participants because uh, we have some people have joined so uh, my uh, request to uh, anybody who want to ask question please be very specific uh, unmute yourself and ask your question and also uh, let us know that to whom you want this answer so now uh, i am opening up for the participant to raise the question so please raise your hand uh, who wants to ask question what's 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 the name yeah mr sandeep baskar baba sir what is your question yeah, yeah sir uh, thank you for giving me an opportunity to ask the question my question to panelist is uh, maybe uh, i think the question maybe i anyone can answer the what you said you know right is a quality of plagiarism software you know mm -hmm. is the uh, i mean is the main criteria here because see mm -hmm. uh, this urkun software and turnitin i mean turnitin has covered cross ref also mm -hmm. and when we are talking about similarity i mean as in india UGC has given us some uh, uh, this in the policy uh, some Sandeep, similar uh, Sandeep, similar please, percentages. Sandhi, please be specific. What is your question? Yeah, sir. So my question is like, uh, which one is the best software? I mean, is it Urkund or Turnitin, or it depends on their coverage, or or what are the other criteria? Okay, I got your question. So, who would like to answer uh, this question? Uh, Chair Nalini or Mr. um uh, from what i have used is turn it in is really good but it again depends on what your um needs are in other words but i think it's a very comprehensive system uh which allows you to uh like uh, meenal just explained um you know it allows you to put in those um uh what did i use the screen or the sensors so that you can go to the depth and to the specificity that you want and um i love that it, it was yeah. really good but um that is my um maybe meenal has something else to share she likes uh, some other software i am uh, i am also in favor of turnitin and uh, okay. sandeep you rightly mentioned because of the co comprehensive coverage uh, depends on the uh, database entirely and definitely when you test the same content by using urkun and the same content if you are checking by using turnitin it gives you two different results because of the uh, coverage difference and the additional features which you are getting in uh, turnitin definitely yeah. differs from others so my opinion is uh, definitely turnitin is a good uh, similarity you, checking thank software right. thank you turnitin it, yeah i what I also want to add is yes turnitin uh, in fact turnitin is the required software in my university yes. uh, so students have to use uh, turnitin they have to submit okay. their paper and all that stuff and uh, uh, another advantage is they have a good training <laughs> Not, not yeah. Good, good yeah. Thank you, Bernard. See, uh, let me add one more important thing in this. Uh, quality of any plagiarism check software is based on three important parameters. The first is the what are the content coverage, how many database and that contest 
Right. They all are right because Tanitin is having cross ref. Second important is how many languages software is checking yes. the content. And that way also Tanitin is having 27 languages. And yes. third important thing is that various kind of upgrade and user friendliness, the way mm -hmm. uh, it has been designed with the uh, connection with you, uh, teacher and student relationship, it, it, it uh, always uh, uh, have monopoly uh, on that context. Okay. So we can take one more question from the participants. So, uh, so please raise your hand. Who is having question? Uh, anybody have uh, any? Oh, I think Susan. Uh, Susan, Susan, Susan Bainscott, Susan yeah. Bainscott Susan. has a question. Yeah, Susan, please unmute uh, yourself and ask the question. Hello, can you hear me okay? Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Have any of you used something like Cornell University's Writing Center plagiarism quiz to walk through with groups of students and show them varying levels of plagiarism? And, and how it's also, it's the citation and quotation marks as well as moving away from patch writing. I'm gonna put it in the chat. We use this at UNLV um, primarily with civil engineering students, both the entering graduate students who come from all over the world and also the mid-level undergraduate students in one of their mm -hmm. required courses. And we have discussions after the first three and then we, we send them off and they, they have small group discussions on four, five and six. And honestly, as a faculty member who writes, I struggle with some of the examples because they're very nuanced. So I, do you all do things like that? Yes, um, uh, we, yes. Yeah. go ahead, Mila. Um, no, I just oh, uh, wanted to, um, I haven't gone to your website, but we do very similar things. We actually collaborate with the librarians, instructors, and the students. So there is a collaboration. Every single faculty member has to collaborate with one of the faculty in the library. And they usually, they will bring the students and we go through the uh, entire orientation. It lasts about an hour. We do have pre-test and post-test for the, so it's, it's very similar to what you're saying but the college that I work at is a community college. So the differences between <laughs> the research students and, and it's very important, I mean, for them to learn that because that's how they learn at a young age. And then at the medical um, library that I worked for, that was a totally different thing. But we do exactly the same things that you talked about. Um, not only that, we actually sit down and help the instructors to refine their um, exercises or the instructions so that there are less chances of plagiarism. Because many times it depends on what kind of um, exercises are given where it's very easy to plagiarize. So all those things, steps are taken. And then students can make actually their own um, uh, appointments with the specialists in that area. So they're always available and they can do, and we also have open virtual rooms where we can sit with the students and do that. Yes, and we also have plagiarism related information on each yes, course on syllabus. Uh, so every course syllabus uh, that's required for students to read this and they have to sign it that they have read it. That is one thing. Yeah. And the second thing is, we also have created plagiarism library guide with a set of tutorials on this. And I think one of these, uh, the link that you mentioned is also we have used it some, in some classes. Mm -hmm. uh, and then they do have to take a quiz. They have to pass that quiz before mm -hmm. they can do the next assignment. And we have a similar, we have actually a huge website section, which, which is, you know, with links to all the different, mm -hmm. yeah. So that's very, very useful, very helpful. So thank you, Sushan. Uh, we are almost uh, reached 10 minutes to left. Uh, uh, I, I know there will be several questions. The topic is such a uh, interested and important. 
that mm -hmm. uh, we can discuss hours for that. Uh, uh, and, uh, we can, and this is, is something very useful conversation. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Educators, uh, researchers. Only, uh, can I add one thing? It is totally uh, uh, additional angle I, uh, I would like to mention here uh, with the permission of a moderator. Uh, just one minute because uh, you'll yeah, be taking only one and, minute. Uh, yeah. <laughs> only one minute <laughs> actually uh, just uh, it click in my mind that uh, um, as we are having the global uh, repository of the thesis published uh, thesis submitted in various universities uh, we should uh, try to uh, prepare one uh, repository of the, uh, synopsis in prog or the thesis in progress or the synopsis accepted at uh, the various universities if we club it it may um, save the time of uh, the uh, researchers whatever the th uh, research topics are uh, are being conducted at various universities at various levels uh, because in india we are having show the gangotri for that so if we are having at another places in the entire globe we can do that that's what is only the additional is, suggestion thank you is, so much this is excellent idea and just to add to this, uh, we wow. had Great. one of our professors who mm. worked on a project called uh, Archives of Failed Experiments. And okay. the, reason, the reason was uh, in the scientific world, any failed experiment, if they are not reported and somebody tries to mm -hmm. do the same thing, you're wasting so much time. So, okay. uh, so that was very useful. And I think Minal's your idea okay. was it's excellent. I think Oh, so, thank yeah. you. We should work on that. I think. Yeah, thank you, Minal. Uh, what idea you have given uh, is already like uh, you have mentioned Gangotri, Chor right. Gangotri. But unfortunately, such ideas uh, they mm. are very few takers. Right. Uh, because uh, academic community, uh, they have a lot of mindset. They are a lot of uh, uh, like uh, possessiveness about the work. Mm. So they don't want to disclose it that what topic they are doing <laughs> research because. I tried to create this in JNU promoting Sol Gangotri. It was very, very difficult because people yeah. don't want to share it. Oh, so thank you. That... Uh, friends. So uh, we are coming close to this. And uh, let me have a few, few words uh, before we close this. Uh, <laughs> uh, first of all, uh, thank you, uh, Nalini. Oh, thank, you, okay. thank you, Thank you, Minal, for wonderful thank you uh, so much. Uh, submission. And I'm sure uh, participants have enjoyed it. We are living in a technology age, and uh, now we have several ch challenges. Like many of the challenges, which I would like to highlight here, uh, is that uh, when you want to do something good thing, uh, the smart people uh, who want, have intentional uh, plagiarism uh, have it. They try to find out certain kind of pitfalls or fault in the system. So when we talk about uh, checking plagiarism using various kind of software. Uh, still, uh, idea plagiarism is not checkable. You cannot find out if suppose somebody has copied the idea. Even I have seen students are very smart. There are there are a number of softwares which can just uh, convert your uh, text in such a format that the similarity percent will be zero. And uh, like uh, I, I have discussion with Turnitin and uh, Urkund in this regard that uh, how to deal with that? Because uh, students are so smart, they are using certain yeah. tools and they are able to mm. get 0% zero, zero similarity. Another uh, a challenge which is coming so far is that uh, we are talking about uh, research misconduct, uh, which is part of research publication ethics. But now there are uh, research misconduct post-publication also. Uh, that is also a kind of uh, 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 nonsense in the uh, uh, research writing and publishing. So what is important? Actually, we have to uh, innovate our ways of working and library community has to understand this responsibility. And unfortunately, uh, what I have seen, uh, no much research has been done in this area in library science schools and departments. Because I believe we need to really work on these issues. We do research on different library topics, but this itself is a library topic. So our department should think of having uh, new ways of dealing with such, such issues. 
that's a, uh, those who are doing intentional plagiarism but in my opinion majority researcher do not want to do plagiarism it is happening because of uh, like meenal talks about 70% similarities i have seen thesis with 80 to 85% similarities My but God. that is not because they want to copy something mm. there are many most of mm. them like what was their understanding i will tell you when i call those students and i ask them why these similarity so their understanding of citation was that sir i have given reference in the <laughs> list yes. now i can take whatever i want to take yes. So yes that was their understanding of the uh, citation rules So it was yeah. not their fault because he was he was believing that uh, now I have given the reference and whatever I want I can take it. So we have to really uh, have big task of creating awareness. Another issue which we talk about uh, this plagiarism checking softwares. Nalini, you given a, a opinion about free software, but uh, I am always recommending not to use free open access yeah. software. Uh, because of various reasons the first most important reason the quality of a plagiarism checking software is that as i mentioned content matching and these yes. free software does not have access to cross ref or commercial sites so when they are giving you results these results are not correct these Accurate, are results yes. inaccurate results so yes. then you are in confusion because they will show you very minimum even when 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 this uh, sandeep asked question about Orkund and Turnitin. That is a basic difference because Orkund is not having access to Crossref because it charged for it. I actually uh, don't know what that is. The one that he mentioned, I only well, knew the Turnitin, so I didn't know the other one. Yeah, yeah. So basically, it is because of the content batching. Yes. So in that context, I, I, I think quality software is very important. Oh yes. That, that's why Turnitin is having a monopoly all over yes. the world. Yeah. They they are monopolizing the world in in this yeah. context. So, and apart from that, it is also important that uh, we need to develop a lot of guides. Like we talk about library guides and research guides, but in this area, it is important to even to train the staff that how to use the various kind of software, how to detect plagiarism, and another important thing: uh, various ways of uh, how to enhance the quality of our uh, writings by organizing author workshop. There are many ways of. Uh, working so when you want to talk about research integrity or academic integrity there are n number of topics and a librarian has to take this and i can tell you this is this is something uh, a very good awareness has been created i i don't hesitate in taking claim for it because i remember when i started this in gnu in 2012 in india nobody talks about this and uh, i i i know that now every university every college every place librarians are taking lead in organizing workshops it's fantastic it's really good so, it is so it that, is fantastic it is really I, good I, I, yeah and, and when i was appointed the member of this uh, ugc draft regulation committee mm-hmm. i say proudly that india is the first country to have regulation on plagiarism i i talked oh, to the president of us academic integrity association uh, he was in india for some program Uh, where i was honored for this work and uh, he mentioned that i am so glad india is able to bring out this regulation we mm-hmm. cannot think the same in the us because there is so much conflict and this famous uh, autonomy and all, all those issues so with this no, it, is, of, it yeah. is very very and the reason i mentioned the free because not everyone can afford that Absolutely. is the thing yeah so and then in india there is so much going i mean i learned it from your bibliography on on plagiarism and the workshops that you have presented and even this i am so thankful to jay uh, to invite me as one of the panelists because i learned a lot from you all it, it is uh, a lifelong it's, learning it's, just it's a lifelong a learning amazing. every day yeah yeah, yeah. we and learn from I the students we need another session because we were not able to even touch upon um uh, i think one hour minute. is not enough for this <laughs> one hour is not enough it looks like but one yes, thing i yes, also yes. want to uh, mention also is uh teaching academic integrity and yes. research integrity uh, we focus on plagiarism which is mainly for undergrad and all uh, students who are just trying to it but there's a huge problem with research integrity as well 
yeah. you know, the professional researchers are manipulating data. They are uh, showing, uh, doing something like data fabrication to show something that mm -hmm. they want mm. to be published uh, instead of uh, the right uh, uh, paper, right data. And even well-known professors have been caught plagiarizing. And, okay. Yeah. That is um, true. This, this is true. manipulation. Well, that Dr. Gore, you know, there yeah. was one question I think, you know, we <laughs> didn't touch upon so many things, but I think the open access that has created such a big problem. It's yeah, really actually, good I, to have I that. Ha I was having questions about predatory publishing. Yes. I was, yeah, I was, yeah but, that is true. Um, you know, no, 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 no. But I, it is yeah. not. Uh, yeah. Yes, it has. Thought, that, oh my uh, yes. gosh, that was. But yeah. that I, is I why. That be, yes. That is why this awareness is required. Yes. Not all open access is bad. And yes, uh, yes, yes exactly. Uh, but it right. has created lots of issues. And it has yes. created issues, and we have yes. uh, predatory so publications is being issued. The, yeah, there are yeah. there are criteria to decide now. Uh, predatory. Oh yeah, you know. there are criteria. Yes. But yeah. you know, when you go to uh, what's his name, the famous. Uh, authority um who has the list of all the there the list of we have yeah yes James Bill, yes Bill says. but i wish maybe yes. next time we yeah. should actually focus on that actually that my, suggestion, uh, uh, my suggestion <laughs> is that we have to decide a particular topic if you have yes. to discuss on predatory publishing let's i agree on only that only that and, yeah. and in fact yeah, we can we can yeah, I, do a series I of workshops like this. That would be focus. That would be Seriously. Seriously. Every, every topic is important. In mm. this. Yes. And Seriously. what I do also suggest is we can uh, open it up to all students in all institutions. So who is ever able to um, yeah, that's come excellent attend. Idea. So it's kind right. of a training for them as well. At the yes. Time. yes. Yeah. Correct. We definitely need Dr. Gaur to, to do this again. <laughs> and focus on that. No, because I would love that topic. It, it would true. be great, I think. So uh, I think we have already uh, reached one hour. So yes. uh, Jordan uh, will come back. <laughs> or, uh, <laughs> The only doing? thing I want to mention is that uh, this uh, was, uh, I want to give a credit to the Special Library Association on uh, Professional yes. Development Committee, where we were uh, uh, in, um, uh, invited to uh, present uh, uh, topics for presentation, and in which I uh, talked about it and it got accepted. And then uh, we started setting up the panel uh, as, and uh, I think it came out very well. And thank you so much, Dr. Yes. Gaur, Nalini, Minal, everyone. Uh, we have come closer to each other as well in doing so. Yes. We were able to share new ideas. We learned from each other. I learned about this new self-citation misconduct from Switzerland, which have a tremendous uh, <laughs> uh, implication. Um, uh, uh, and I strongly encourage you to look at it because self-citation is a big problem. Also, right. thank you. Oh yes, thank you, Jay. Thank you, Minal. Uh, thank you, Nalini. And uh, to the participants uh, on this topic, I have a YouTube channel. Uh, hundreds of my talks on these topics are available. So if you want to know more about these topics, please feel free to join it. And uh, now I think uh, uh, we uh, we need to close, uh, or Jordan will come to. Yeah, Jordan will come. <laughs> I'm here. Yeah, I'm here. I have to love you. <laughs> thank you all. Thank you so much, Dr. Thank you all. and Jay and Mino for making me part of this panel. Thank you again. Absolutely. We also thank you all. Thank you very much. And you all have a and wonderful afternoon. We will afternoon. continue to collaborate in one way or the other in times to come. Sure. Yes, that's wonderful. certainly. Certainly. That's very wonderful. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Good night.